Hi everyone, in this tutorial we're going to take on a watercolor challenge that's going to have a ton of color and a ton of texture in it. It is actually a close-up study of a fig tree. Now, I photographed it on a rainy overcast day, which really gives it tons of natural color. Now, back in the film days, that was the only way you got saturation, right after a rain. Now, without further ado, let's get this drawn out and get it started and just see how we're going to take on this type of a challenge. Okay, let's open up our reference image and see what we're in for. Uh, just as a quick review, again, window, just hit reference images. You click on that, this panel will come up. And then if you click on that, uh, then uh, you can open it up. And if you need to import your image, just right here, import new reference image. And here's my reference images under my file system. And I had a uh, vertical panoramic and a horizontal panoramic. Panoramics are a little bit tougher to keep uh, a strong composition in within a panoramic. It's more of a challenge. Square format is probably arguably the easiest, whereas panoramic to keep somebody looking throughout your entire image, you have to space things out. Uh, then we're going to do this horizontal. I thought it loaned itself to the watercolor painting. Now if I would click on that, open it up, this is what we would get, and I have it nice and big already, and this is what we're in for. Tons of texture, tons of color, and a lot of interesting shapes and contours uh, throughout this particular image. And there is some really nice color unity going on here too. And then also the what I would call lost and founds. Now what a lost and found is, is just nothing more than a found is a very hard edge, white edge, up against a very dark background. That tends to jump out at you. And that's what we're going to play up in this painting. Now, a lost is nothing more than where, like these two shapes right here, way up on top in the middle, of where you actually uh, could uh, see uh, the colors of two different objects blending together very well. And what that does is create a lost between the two shapes, and that provides you with an actual three-dimensional movement. You can go from one object to another just by color transition, and that will take you into the painting or into the photograph. Now, since we're going to use that as playing up with our watercolor, then what we'll do is I am actually going to block out some of the white areas. And even though this photograph has tons of color and tons of texture, I'm hoping to actually keep the white areas as the subjects or as the focal points of the painting. And this way then, uh, I will be able to force the viewer to bounce around throughout the painting just by keeping some hard white sh uh, shapes up against a very colorful background. So let's go ahead and draw this out and see what we got. And then we will go ahead and start layering in our paint. Working in watercolors, I like to often draw everything out first. I have to know where my shapes are. I cannot go back in and block out anything if it's wrong. Uh, the transparent layers do not cover well. You can trace if you want to, but then you will only be limited to the exact photograph and it does not give you an opportunity to come up with a unique design. Let's see what we got and we'll take a look on how we're going to block this in. Okay, we got our fig tree drawn out, uh, just roughed in. I went back and forth and just uh, adjusted the pencil drawing and I did change some things uh, from the original photograph. Uh, just slightly, but just enough. If we could fill in the gaps, that's all we need to worry about. Now, we're ready to go ahead and just start putting in some very basic base layer paint. Uh, that would be just some of the unique colors uh, that are shared throughout the photograph. And then what we will do is drop those in. And then I'm also going to build a mask on top of that. This way, the mask will not be just protecting just white paper there will already be color underneath the mask. That way we won't have any pure white until the very end or unless we choose to. We're gonna build up layers of paint on top of that and then we will go back and forth and actually take layers of paint out also. But what we wanna do is just keep with a layering system. This will be many coats of paint over each other and then we'll be slowly taking some paint away just to create edges and uh, further define our shapes. Let's get started. Okay, now I'm just starting to block in some of my uh, values. 
what I will do is just use some of the colors that I will be using throughout the painting. And these are just very preliminary washes because keep in mind when you're working with transparent watercolors, every layer you put down does make a difference. Since you can see all the way through to the paper, then how we build up our layers is what's going to determine our final shapes in the end. And this is where we are going to slowly build up layers and then we will slowly take them away also. This is what will make the painting look more complex than it really is. Now keep in mind when I'm building up the actual masks, I'm trying to actually create a texture for it too. So it's just not straight edges unless I want one. But then however, if some of the masks are not coming out opaque enough, then I can also use the transparent lock with the black just so I could build over the exact area I want to and not create a bigger mask than I really need to. This way I will control my mask area. Okay, let's see what we got here. I just got the preliminary colors down and the burnt sienna, Prussian blue, cobalt violet, a lot of the uh, interesting colors that will be throughout the whole painting. Uh, even the potter's pink and this color down in here, certain areas if we look at our photograph again. But we will go back to it shortly. But what I wanted to point out now was I'm going to start darkening up layers. And what I will do is start building up off of this base. And then I'll just keep on creating more and more layers of paint. But what I will do is take it up to about my medium values. Because what I want to have room for is to still be able to go darker yet on top of everything I'm about to paint now. And then I will also reverse that and start erasing out. But if I have multiple layers of colors, then what I will do is actually go in and with a selection tool, maybe just go around some of these edges. Now keep in mind, our mask is still here too. So if I go around some of these edges anywhere and then protect certain areas and, and give a little bit of a hard coat to some of these uh, just separate small branches, then I could either make them darker or use an eraser part of the brush and then pull some colors out. But if I make multiple layers, what I want to be able to do is either add colors or pull colors out from different layers so they don't align perfectly. And then when I get a lot of uh, stippling effect, texture effect that overlaps each other, then that's what will make the painting look complex. If I did all this on one layer and then just started trying to pull out highlights here or there, I would end up going down to pure white and I don't want that. And then even if I try to take out just a certain amount of opacity, if I adjust my brush, it'll leave things looking kind of washed out and I'll lose the snappiness of my color. Now, so with all that in mind, we're just going to go ahead in and speed paint uh, some actual uh, layers and we'll add to the base. We'll just keep on adding base layers. And then once we get some of that done, we'll stomp and take a look and see what we have. In this particular speed painting clip, I actually slowed it down just a little bit, just so you can actually see the colors mixing. Here I'm about to put on a splashed water over an already wet layer. This will give me my maximum diffusion. And what I'm trying to actually do is control the uncontrollable. Although I want my paint and water to do its thing, I have to be careful where the colors are actually mixing and what kind of values I'll be left with. They still have to render and form my cylindrical shapes that make up the branches. Then keep in mind, I'm also working around my masked areas to actually further define where my dark areas will be. I could go back in and lift out some of the lighter areas, but I can also then leave my mid-tones and no darker, then this way it will allow me some room to go back in and even darken some areas even further. Once we are done with this particular wash, then it will be a combination of all the layers put together. That is kind of important only because I cannot do this with just one layer. I would actually be taking my erasing down to the paper and not just a layer below. Let's see what we got. Okay, let's take a look and see what we have. Just to enlarge this just a little bit, here is our navigator right here. This is 70... 80, 90, there's 100% right there. And if I even start moving this around, you can actually see just how many variations of color we have just with the multiple layers. Now, if I start turning these off, you'll see what a difference any one area makes. 
and just how much they could build up on top of each other only because you could see every layer until you actually see the paper. Now, fitting it back on a screen, what we will do is actually start it's in this corner right here, and I could start lightening up some of this little one right here and darkening up the backside, because then now that we have our medium values down, then we can lighten some up in some areas and darken some up in other areas. But what we'll do is we'll try to actually start being more specific of where we're going to do that, and start doing branches one at a time. Now doing that though, I can actually keep my dark areas on their own layers also, and then just call dark one, dark two, dark three, however you wanna do it, but then that way you can actually go back in and lighten up some of those dark areas if you want to. Again, with a painting such as this, just keep yourself as many options as you can. And then lighten them up, what I will do is then just start clicking on specific layers and with my selection key right here, the freehand selection key, and I will also add to selection, I'll keep that actually on. Then this way, when I go to start pulling out some of these areas, like this, I can add this area to it up here already also. And I don't even have to hold down the shift key as long as I have this button selected. So that is just the add to selection. So you could either add to what you have like this, or you can actually add a separate, completely unique shape. That will give you the opportunity to be very specific as to where you want to erase or add colors to within your selection area. And then again, of course, uh, it will still all go by your original masking area which would be this right here, and I will turn it up so we can see where it's at. Now, everything you see black right now will actually be the lighter color areas, borderline white, but being that I have some colors under them, then I, I will still have some values that I could start to work with. Now, if we start doing some of these over here, I could do those in real time, and then we will actually see what I'm doing and then what we could do is just start, in fact, what we'll do is we'll just go ahead and I'll hit Control D to deselect. And we will go ahead and just start this off just like this. And I'll redo this area. And just to give you a rough idea, what we're going to do for a lot of these branches, just like that. And then now this one is fairly small, so I just made the edges straight. Some of these bigger ones, I'm going to start making some uneven lines and just a little bit of uh, character and texture here and there, even on their edges, because as much texture as they have in the front of them, I don't want their sides to be perfectly straight. But then now I'll also go ahead in and actually just create a layer, and we'll just call it Dark 1. And that's where I'll put the darker colors. And what I can actually do is, what I would actually do is bring in, let's see if we can open up our reference. And then we will open it up just to show you where we're going to be working from. This area right up in here, I'll enlarge it. This area right in here we'll start with. And then what I could do is actually, I'll do this one right here first. And what I'll do is I'll darken the right side of it in some areas, but then I can even lighten the, the, the upper side, the left side of it, in other areas. But again, we will actually go ahead and do that on this layer. And let's grab our burnt sienna. Uh, we will use the spots, and then I have a lot of water in this, because the layer itself is dry, so I'm not worried about that. But if I leave water in the paint, then if I go back over with another color, it will blend nicely. Let's try this. We're going to take it down in size and the opacity. We'll keep it up and then we'll leave that on the dark layer. And then I'll just put some of these down. And then I'll have my hand on the quick dry too. And then I'll put some burnt sienna in this. And then also now I'm taking the Prussian blue. And then you can see what it's doing. And it's giving me, I stopped it. But it's giving me nice hard edges on one side, blending in between, and then it'll go by the actual obvious uh, selection tool on the other side. 
But then now, if I actually go to one of these, let's say the dark three, or I'm sorry, the base three, then if I use the same brush, but I take it to an eraser, now, if I start taking some of this color we put down before out, go to four, take some out more, and try two. And then now you can see we're taking some out. And that'll be a little bit of everything as far as once I start doing this. Now I'm starting to get a specific shape, even though I have uh, tons of actual texture. Now I'll say, for example, if I, I just hit Control D to unselect that, I will go back to my selection tool, zoom in a little bit, and we'll do this one next just to give us a rough idea. And I will do these just like that. So now if I have that shape, I could start with my number three and then you can see if I turn any one of these off, how much it'll change. And that is all the layers added up in specific areas. But we'll start with number three and then I'll go to the same brush, use it as an eraser. And then what I will do is actually take some away on this side and then we'll keep this side a little wee bit darker. And then you can see the, the burnt siennas and purples up here mixing, really doing a nice watercolor wash that is about as close to traditional as I could get digitally. And then I'll go back to my dark one and then we will grab the burnt sienna again and then maybe even go to a sepia and then now I'll put this on this side and then grab the sepia and put a little bit there. Let it blend a little bit and stop it because I don't want it to bleed too much together because then I'll just get a neutral color and I'll start losing my contrast. Right now I'm putting more sepia down but I'm quick drying it every time I touch it. And that way it won't mix. And now if we zoom in on that, hit the control D, then you'll see what I'm after. And this is how we could start building our actual branches here and there. And then that way, uh, this is what will define all of them. And then again, I could go back in and darken up some areas, lighten up more areas. But this is going to quickly make and render a very strong texture very quickly this is already a hundred percent and this is what we would have that there's light on one side even though these two areas right here were completely perfectly the same color in the same pattern now that i went back over this side with an eraser i defined that edge and then even though they were again the same over here i took even more dark on this side and defined that edge so i started out with medium values and then I went light on one side, darker on the other, and I defined my entire edge uh, of both sides of the branch that way. And then you could see how uh, it's starting to come alive already uh, just by these. And then if I would have finished this one up through here, then that would have uh, further defined that branch back in here. And then you could see even over here, uh, this is really dark in here. So I can even take this area, if I put my drawing back, I could take this area right in here and over, and I can even make it quite a bit darker. But then once I start getting into these, uh, just like this one here, this branch right here is actually this branch right here. So I can actually make this area darker to define this branch, and then make that one even a little bit darker more to define this branch. And all it's going to be is dark against light and light against dark. That's it. But we will have a very complicated set of textures that we will be starting off with. Let's see if we can get some of this done in a little bit of speed painting. Okay, all I'm doing is actually just going in with the freehand tool and then just uh, selecting specific areas just to either lighten or darken. Again, if I want to lighten a specific side of one of these branches, 
I will choose different layers that I've already created to go back in and erase some of them. I don't obviously want to erase all the layers uh, because then I will be back to the white paper. If I mix and match what I'm erasing, then I will get sporadic shapes and sporadic values, which is something I want. This is a very sporadic uh, looking tree, so I want to try and keep my painting the same way. I can also use the control shift if I hold that down on my keyboard and then either click with my pen or actually uh, left click with my mouse. I could select the layer I want, but then sometimes being that I have multiple layers built up, I may have to go back and just find that specific layer that I want to erase. Because keep in mind, uh, when you build up multiple layers like this, the one that you may select may always be that top layer. And if that's the one you work on, great. If not, you may have to search below that. That's why I built up my layers in sequence, the base and the darker ones. Let's take a look and see what we got. Okay, let's take a look and see what we have. Uh, now, we're at a stage in this painting where I still have time to make adjustments for my composition. Now, composition is extremely subjective. And what I do for my own personal composition with both photos and paintings is I just try to get enough elements of composition to actually get the majority of viewers to see what I want. You'll never get everybody to see what you expect, but if you get the majority, you're not doing bad. So right now, if I have a painting full of vivid colors, of, of oranges, purples, uh, even some values of reds and, and, and deep blues and, and uh, light turquoise colors, very vivid colors, then I may have a little bit more of a difficult time to actually portray any one of those groups of colors as a subject. So I may have to rely on contrast and shapes. With that in mind, uh, what I will use is the lack of all color, a white shape. And if I use this uh, branch right here, this particular branch on the left here, as my first initial shape, right now I have some shapes that are actually going to compete with that specific shape. If I have uh, too many shapes uh, that I am trying to use as eye grabbers or even more importantly a secondary subject, which is usually what you see or what grabs your attention after the first object you see that grabs your attention, then it may be confusing. Uh, the viewer may not know what to look at first or even second for that nature. Uh, now, with that said, what I will probably do is actually take this one, this one, and even this one over here and tone them down a little bit so they are brighter than anything else in the painting, but still darker than the first initial white shape I want you to see. Now, to reduce things to shapes, uh, black and white photography, when you're out and about photographing, and you see a whole bunch of vivid colors in nature or wherever you're photographing, usually we squint our eyes. That reduces everything to shapes, and then that helps you decide on what your composition could be, and it tries to help you eliminate colors. Now, that's something an artist can even do when they are looking at a live model, a still life, anything like that, because then you are then reducing everything to shapes, and you're trying to eliminate what color does to your composition. Now, for us now, what we could easily do is just hit view and then just grayscale G or just a letter G on the keyboard, and that will reduce everything to a grayscale. And that's very important because now we're only working with shapes. We eliminated what color does to our design. And now I can easily see how this one is pretty white over here, but then also these are just as white for now, so I will have to tone them down. And for that reason, uh, this will help me uh, in middle stages of my painting just to help me figure out if my design is heading in the right direction. Now, there's also a couple other things you could do. And one of them is, I'll just turn this back to color. In the uh, conservation and duck, duck stamp uh, industry, they actually make their paintings real small also to have a, a print that goes with a stamp in a lot of collectors. Now that's very important because what happens is that design has to hold together in a very small stamp. 
So if I take this down and reduce it down to what I would consider a stamp size, then I can easily see how my colors and shapes are working if I have enough contrast. If this little stamp shape size painting turns into a medium gob of colors, then chances are nothing's going to be there that would grab my attention for the initial viewer to look at the painting. With this in mind, I can now see that my design is a pretty linear vertical pattern and I could definitely see my uh, deep blues uh, that are used for shadow areas and then also the warmer colors splashed around to begin my color unity and the warmer areas that would be out of the shadows. Uh, easily establishing cools for shadows and, and the warmer colors for what's up closer to you is, is a good safe way to start but I have a long way to go yet. Now, if I actually take this up to the uh, full size, then all I'm going to be doing is using my freehand selection tool and just keep on selecting specific areas and spe specific branches to either erase some of the layers away that are already established or add even darker colors to them to push them back a little bit or actually just to uh, keep that cylindrical shape that I want also. But now once we start to finish this up, we're gonna go into uh, the Nano and we're going to print it bigger. And what we'll do is we'll discuss how that could change your painting. We sh shrunk it down, we turned it into to a grayscale, but we also have to consider what's gonna to happen to our painting if we enlarge it a great deal. There will be a couple of things to talk about then but let's go ahead and get this painting done. Okay, again, I'm just using the freehand selection tool and drawing specific shapes around the branches and even the negative areas to either lighten them or darken them. Again, I'll go back and use my actual control shift and then left click with a mouse or actually just use my pen to select specific layers but sometimes when you build up layers over each other that will only select the top layer so what I may want to do is just go back and still search for those other layers I want to erase in a sporadic way so I'm not just erasing all the layers for sure but then I also want to erase different layers in different places and that will give me the sporadic colors and shapes that I'm looking for and then keep in mind, uh, to use digital as a, a, an advantage to you, then what I also would suggest is if you do need to go back into some of the areas to make them lighter or darker, consider your clone tool. Uh, that would work really good. I'll put up uh, some other tutorials that I have just about the clone tool for a much more in-depth look on them. But when you already have established patterns and established colors then it's a good idea to just use what you already have there because you are using transparent watercolors so if you want to tr try and destroy an edge or get rid of a shape it might be much more difficult to try and use it in a traditional watercolor way versus just trying to clone over what's already there and rearranging your shapes that way this way you can actually then uh, use colors and patterns that are already there that may be pretty tough to duplicate uh, in a watercolor sense. In other words, you've already left those watercolors do whatever they want. It may be pretty tough to get them to do the exact same thing again. Going back in with some of my script work, I'm actually just leaving those on their own layers also so I can manipulate them, lighten them, darken them, and even more importantly, change the blend mode so it doesn't look like a layer floating above the rest of the painting. Let's take a look and see what we have. Okay, let's take a look and see what we have. Uh, here's my finished piece, and uh, I would go over it a little bit more, maybe spend a little bit more time with it, because as I said uh, throughout this tutorial, I like to even... Uh, set things aside and just look at it with a fresh eye even sometimes get some honest feedback from somebody I trust uh, but what we'll do now is here is the original photograph and this is what the original photograph looks like again I shot this during the rain and then here is what I got out of it so this is what I would go with but now as we uh, discussed before uh, this right here white area 
makes a pretty good eye grabber. And keep in mind, there isn't too much going on right in that shape. There, it's just meant to actually grab your attention to this side of the painting. And then hopefully there's enough contrast and color to keep you moving throughout the painting. Enough hard edges like this one right here, uh, these right in here, uh, and then also then just the, uh, the different branches or the hard edges here that will keep you moving around uh, with uh, enough contrast. But to get you to move from one side of the painting to the other, this is what I had in mind. But now what I do need is one up in here. I don't want to put it down here because then if I have a real hard white shape over here, then you would just go back and forth across the bottom half of the painting and it would kind of eliminate the entire top half. So usually when you have a primary subject and a secondary subject, they're usually on opposite corners. This way you have to move through the painting or image uh, diagonally and include the entire painting. And then it'll be up to other types of elements of composition to keep that moving in a uh, oval or circular motion. Now what I did was I found out down here that the base two, three, and four are the ones that can take this area completely down to white. So what I did was I actually took these three and I will just do it to show you what I did. And then I duplicated them over. And then now while they were still uh, selected as the duplicates, I merged those three. And then here they are right here. Now they're merged. And then I just called it working two, three, four. That's the exact same thing as what we got. So if I turn this one off, that's just to show you what I did. But now I'll turn off three, uh, four, and two. And then now what I have is just all the way back to my white. But then if I turn on my merged one, then this is the exact same thing as four, three, and two. But what I did was I took this little area out and erased it out down to the white. So now I do have a, a white section on the opposite corner. And if that carries you over to the opposite corner of the painting, and then hopefully starts you back through with all the detail, texture, colors, uh, and edges, lost and founds, because those are important, uh, then what I could do is consider that option. But if I don't like it, then all I have to do is turn that one off and turn these back on, and I'm right back to where I was. So it's just an option of what something looks like compared to something else. And now again, another one would be actually uh, this spaghetti right here. And I call it spaghetti because this painting took a while. And when I paint that long, I start to think of food. So for that reason, uh, I have spaghetti one, two, and three. And then this spaghetti right here uh, is actually uh, doing something in intentionally. And what I mean by that is here is three right here. I'll turn it off. But what started bothering me when I started looking at this painting was these two branches right here. They kind of ended up in dead center, and I really, I'm not too crazy about that. Uh, without them, then I would have a big, giant shape dividing my painting in half, and I definitely don't want that. But when I put those two in, I was thinking about dividing that shape, but I didn't know where it would turn out and how it would turn out until I started applying color to it. But then now I put those in kind of dead center and I'm not too happy with that. Now for some, it may not bother you, uh, but for me, it's, it's something to at least think about. So now what I did was being that these spaghettis are on their own layer, uh, then what I could do is actually uh, I did lift one off and moved it over to here and found out that I like that better. So I went ahead and put in a separate one, which is right here. And what that did was kind of diminish these two branches and then also diminish the bottom half of this uh, entire big branch here. And it kind of, kind of solved two problems for me at once. I can't go without those two branches because then I'd have a big giant shape dividing this half and this half. And I don't want that. And then also, uh, then if I put these two in to break that up, I kind of put them right in the middle and that may have caused me some problems too. So solving one problem created another and being that I did these spaghettis right here, hopefully it, it solved both problems. Now the big one is, is, is no longer cutting the picture in half. And then these two smaller branches are also 
uh, diminished because of the spaghetti. Now, here's the thing. We're going to be going into doubling the size of this picture. Well, right now, it's a 20 by 10 at 300 DPI. I'm going to make it a 40 by 20, which is a pretty decent sized picture already at 300 DPI. Now, we're going to go all over this next, but just to set you up for that, one thing we may have to consider, and that is what we'll talk about, a couple of different things, and that is if you're going to enlarge your picture, especially even just as much as twice as much, you have to think of how that's going to affect your painting. In other words, keep in mind, everything's going to double. So if you have nice, thin, fine lines, they're going to be doubled. They're going to be extra thick now. So what I did was I put the spaghetti in, and right now it doesn't look too bad. You start to enlarge it. Uh, here's 40%. Uh, and keep in mind, for me, 34% is a print size. And that we will go over briefly, but that's all going to depend on your monitor and your resolution and the resolution DPI of your painting. But now keep in mind that what I did was I put that spaghetti in, and it, unfortunately, when I start to take it up pretty big, it's pretty sketchy. And if I wanted nice, clean spaghetti, then what I did was I took this one and I, I made a new one, and that's right here. So now, again, since I duplicated over the spaghetti and cleaned it up quite a bit, then for that reason, I would be more happier with this type of vine work and real fine, thin branches uh, coming out. And then here, if you want to even see, like down in here, I cleaned up the edges uh, right along this branch right here because if I turn off the redid one and turn on uh, the uh, turn off that one and then turn on this one, uh, this piece right here doesn't even come down to being behind this branch. Now, subtle, simple little things like that, if they don't bother you, great, or if you want to keep it artsy, or if you want to keep it uh, very uh, sporadic and carefree, that's fine. You're already there. Uh, but if you want to be a little bit more technical uh, as far as what you're painting or how you're doing it or how it's going to be printed, then you may want to uh, look over your painting very carefully. Now, again, we're also going to go over uh, even my uh, line work, which I call my script work, which is right here, these two. And then what I want to do also is I will change the blending mode of that because right now, if it's opaque paint that's not allowing uh, the actual colors to come through it, then it's going to look like a separate layer floating above the painting. I want it to look like it's a part of the painting, uh, being that uh, what I did was I artificially lightened some up, but then I could do that with all the layers uh, since they are on their own layer. And that's why I wanted to put them on their own layer, just so I could adjust them accordingly or change the blending modes if I want. But now with all that in mind, I have a couple of these picked out. And what I did was I just took this particular painting just the way it is right now. I went up to File, and then I hit Nano Pixel Export, and I got this pop-up. I just hit two by two, which now it's going to make it a 12,000 by 6,000 at 300 DPI. And that's a pretty decent sized painting. We'll go over what all you could do with that quite a bit at that size already and that DPI. And then I just hit OK. And then what it'll do is it's bringing it up to all my other uh, images. And I put it right in here, but I put it as a JPEG. And then now these are all the different variations that I saved for you. And we're going to go over every one of them next. Let's do that now. Okay, let's take a look at our 40 by 20s. Now, th these are sizable pictures, uh, and I only enlarged it just uh, two times, meaning that it was originally a 20 by 10, and now all of these layers are each 40 by 20. This is a pretty sizable Rebel file too, just to show you very quickly. Uh, here it is right here, and if I hover over it, it's a 944 meg file. And so, uh, that's getting up there. But now what I did was I picked out this particular photograph only because uh, it has tons of texture. And that's what we're going to compare. Texture to what we enlarged as a painting. That's kind of important. Because right, this picture is a multi-image panoramic, which is very important, only because it's about five vertical images uh, stitched together, and they overlap by about a third each. 
So what that means is it is a camera generated image. It's not artificially enlarged. And that is a big difference. This is an original. Now, here's a couple of things to consider. My print size is about 34% up here in the navigator. Now, what that means is if I put it on 34%, then this image will be 20 inches high by 40 inches wide. And that's kind of important just so you could see what your image will actually look like and the proportions of everything. How big would this tree be? Uh, how will the uh, leaves uh, print out and what have you? And what that that means is that's something you would have to figure out on your own because that's going to have to do with what DPI you use as the image, what DPI your monitor is, and then all you would have to do is figure out that once you get to the point where if you put an 8x8 up on your monitor or whatever you're working on, then if you physically measure it, it should be 8 inches. And then that would be your print size. That way you could view what everything looks like as proportions. So in other words, this one, if I change this to fit it on a screen, it's only 11%. If I make it 34%, this is what it would print out like, and this is what you would actually see as a print. Now, 100% is not actual size. That is not what it would print at. That is what's trying to do is match up pixel for pixel. So being that I'm at 300 DPI and just say, for example, my monitor is 100 DPI, then that means it's going to be three times as big as it really is because it's trying to match up one pixel for one pixel. So it has to make it much bigger uh, for the uh, 300 DPI to match up with 100 DPI. Now, with that said, uh, we'll just stick right now with this, and that is the mine is 34%. Now, what you're viewing on, I have no idea. So I don't know how this is going to look, depending on what you're viewing it on. But for me, this is what I would see as a print, and it would hold out very nice. Uh, but uh, if I even take it up to actual size, then this is now 100%, and you can see how much bigger it, it got because it's 300 DPI trying to project on this particular monitor. Now, if I actually fit it down on screen, uh, there are a couple of things I would consider. And that is even if you're going to get something printed, uh, you have to consider color accuracy. Now, this is all going to depend on how critical you want to get. But now for me, I use uh, just a color monkey uh, setup and that will calibrate uh, my monitors so they're all the same and they're uh, calibrated to the industry standard. And what I mean by that is, uh, one, uh, this is open, and what that will do is calibrate the monitor itself, and then it'll ask me eventually to fold this over and then put this uh, screen on top. It's just like an opaque white, and then that measures the ambient light around me. So keep in mind, when I work on this kind of, of, of uh, photos and different things that I print constantly, I am in an area and in a room that has very little ambient light. In other words, daylight coming in from windows outside because I want to keep my work area as consistent as possible. So whether it be glare from behind, uh, reflections off the monitor, what have you, they could all make a difference in how you perceive color. Now, with that said, uh, what you see behind you is my actual drawing table, uh, and the light is on and facing up towards the ceiling because reflected light is really nice to work with. It's, it's, there's usually no hot spots in reflected light, but that is for strictly video demos only, and that's it. I would completely rearrange that system back there if I was actually doing traditional painting. Because then, you, if you want to get really critical measuring light, then I would use this, and I just by chance have this. This is a, a Minolta Autometer 4, and what I could do with that is either measure incidental light or reflective light. The incidental light, you're actually measuring your light source itself, and the reflective light, you're actually measuring what light bounces off the object you're photographing. Two completely different situations. And then, of course, to get extremely critical... And this was for 4x5 work. That is a spot meter, which measures light at only a 1 degree angle. And that is reflective also. Now, for me, this is how critical I get. How critical you get is up to you. Uh, and that is, if you start printing big, 
then you may have to get critical and you may have to consider everything only because uh, once you start printing big, then not only will everything else get big, but imperfections might also get big. So depending on how you want to do this, this is why we're going to go through this uh, here now. And just for example, uh, first, uh, the script work. Uh, I mentioned that if I wanted to use my script work and change the uh, blend mode or even change uh, just the opacity or different things like that, I kept all that script work on its own layers because I didn't even really know if I wanted to even use it too. And that's what we'll quickly go over here too. So now if I actually turn off my photo and then turn this layer on, here's a couple of the colors I actually used. Uh, one was cobalt violet. This is at 20%. The potter's pink at 50%. And the Prussian blue at 70%. And then the quinacridone gold at 40%. Now, if I turn my photo back on, then you'll see what this is actually doing. And right now, it is in multiply. If I change it to normal, see how it's starting to wash out the colors, especially the darker areas. So now, if I go in and move in, you can see especially what the quinacridone gold is and even the cobalt violet, what it's doing to my darker areas, it's kind of washing them out. But if I make that layer and set it on multiply, then look at the difference of what my script work would be. So in other words, if I take like a 60, 70, 80% sepia color and start laying it over my painting, and then it's going over different values though. It's going over some uh, lighter violets, some darker blues, some medium uh, burnt siennas. Uh, if it's all 80% all the time, it's gonna look like it's floating above the painting. If I wanna try to make it a part of the painting, then if I change that particular blend mode to multiply, then where it is lighter, it will stay lighter. Where it is darker, it will get darker. Now I will put up a uh, link to the brush creator uh, tutorial that, that uh, explains a multiply blend mode in detail. And just by chance, it works better for me here too if I would decide to keep the actual script uh, line work on the painting. But with that in mind, you could see that how uh, if me changing it to blend mode really changes the looks of the colors uh, involved. And then it, what it does is it gives me back my dark areas and it doesn't have them washed out, so to speak, but it still keeps the light areas light, which would be perfect. Uh, just imagine uh, a basketball with lines on it and if you want to paint it and then you paint a specific area uh, in in a, in a hot highlight or, a, or, or just a, the lit side, you wouldn't want those lines to be the same value the whole way around the basketball. They would have to change with your lighting uh, as to where they are on the basketball. Now, with that said, uh, let's fit this back in and I will eliminate this and we will take a quick look at some of these other ones because keep in mind for the photographers, uh, this is actually just straight up uh, plain white. So I can even do this. And if you print this, then what will happen is I could go back to the paper and it's just on white simple. If I change it to watercolor paper and then pick white, which should be right here and hit OK. then it will apply the watercolor paper to my photo, which is great. Uh, that is an option that you can even do uh, for the photographer or even do for your own photography work. Uh, but now keep in mind that you've seen what it did though to the detail. It toned it down a little bit as far as you're introducing a pattern uh, that's kind of chopping up your detail a little bit or your color spaces and, and uh, just uh, introducing a new pattern to what could be soft, subtle colors and edges. Now let's go up to, uh, let's see, I'm going to change it back to white simple. And that is still white. We'll leave it there. And then I'm going to go back up. Now here is uh, just, now here is 80%. I'll fit it on screen. Now this is just a exported, picture that is 40 by 20 at 300 dpi and but this one is just with the white simple flat no 
uh, texture, watercolor paper at all, and we could take a look at it. Now, again, if I put it on 34, that is my print size. So this is what it would actually print like. And what I see on my monitor is would be the scale of the photograph. So that's kind of important because then I could actually see how this would print. And if I have a lot of textures or colors that are blending and, and doing different things, I could see firsthand how it would look on the print if I was standing there looking at the print. Because this is 40 inches wide, and that's a pretty big print. But then I could see a ton of textures, tons of color, and they, they are holding very well. The edges are holding very well. Even if I take it up to actual size, now this is 100%, it's still holding very, very good. But now look at my spaghetti. It's falling apart. It's sketchy. Uh, it's, it's not blending at all. So if I want that look, great. But again, uh, if you're going to enlarge your image up quite a bit, then you may want to really either take a look at it in the printed size that you're going to get printed, or you may have to go back to the original and, and work with it uh, is just far as just how you really want it to print out. Now, this one is the cold press version. And this is with the paper texture. Now, again, this is at 100%. And you can see what the paper texture will do to it. Now, if I change this to 34 again, then this is what I would see as an actual print. And this is how it would print out. And then uh, this one is uh, holding together very well also. And then again, the script work, I have one in here without the script. And I would have to seriously consider what I would want that script work or not. Uh, I have to figure out whether it adds to it or it actually is just distracting. Uh, and then here is the one with no script. And again, um, I might like this one better without the script. Uh, but get, again, if you keep things on individual layers, you'll allow yourself those options because uh, sometimes you really uh, can't tell what you'll like or not like until you see two comparisons side by side. And if I make this 34% again, this is what it would actually print out like. Now, this is the one that has the good spaghetti. Uh, so, uh, again, uh, that would be a little bit cleaner. And the, and the uh, uh, blending of the, of the different colors are a little bit cleaner also. So, depending on what I would want. Now, I have uh, mismatched shapes here with line uh, lighter areas and, and different outlines. So, maybe it might not be as critical that then I could just keep it as a loose-looking painting. And then that's it. Uh, but that would all depend on how much I want to go back and clean up and what the final look I would want. Um, go, moving on, uh, here is, uh, let's see, you know what, let's go to this one. Now this is the, uh, right here, the, uh, the washi long. That's just a different paper. Just keep in mind, once your painting is done, you can go back in and slip any paper you want underneath it, and it'll still take. Now here is the different washi long. And you can see the fibers. This is at 34%, so this is exactly how it would print for me. And what I see on my monitor is the size of the print that would be. And then, uh, and here's one last one. And that would be the, the Lota Rough. But then, that is the exotic papers that are one specific color and that's it. So now I just lost all my highlights. So I would either, if I want to stay with my highlights, I would either have to uh, come in and introduce whites or a uh, lighter, uh, real light gray to go back in and, and more work out my uh, light areas, so to speak, and then introduce those highlights back into it and call it a mixed media. Or I may have to go back to what I like, even in traditional, is the bright white arches, which gives me very bright white uh, highlights if if I need them. And usually, again, uh, with all my paintings personally, I keep pure white as the brightest highlight of the painting and everything else, even if it's a white, snow, anything, it may be toned down a little bit, very light washes of cobalt violets, cerulean blues, cobalt blues, uh, and just to keep the snow clean looking, 
uh, I usually never use browns in my snow. Uh, it'll start to look dirty, even if it does look like that on a photograph. Uh, but for that reason, uh, now this one, again, like I said, it has an interesting look to it with that type of paper, but I don't know if I could live without my highlights. So if I could, uh, this might be an interesting look. And then if not, I would go back uh, to uh, this one right here, which would be my cold press. And this one right here uh, would be uh, the one I'm familiar with, or the outlook would be what I'm used to uh, as far as cold press paper. But again, uh, I got tons of options now. And so for that reason, I can actually uh, figure out what I would like or not like. And if I would send this out to be printed up, then uh, I, I would have the opportunity to see which one I like the most. And uh, a print this size, though, would not be cheap, especially if you start putting it on canvas or what have you. So it's nice to see maybe a couple printed up, but at the same time, uh, you might, you know, <laughs> it might run you uh, a few dollars to, to be able to compare them firsthand uh, uh, after you send them out to get them printed. But now, again, uh, just uh, uh, my opinion, the colors are the most important and the uh, the values as to what you get printed. So uh, you could actually try an old-fashioned way. What I mean by that is if you don't have a color calibrator, then sometimes if you're even working by your own printer and you just even want to print it on your own printer just to see what it looks like, then sometimes what we used to do is everything in reverse. And that is paint what you want and how you want it on your monitor and then print it out. And then if it is that different, take the print copy and try to match up the monitor to it as close as you can, uh, just by eye. But now again, um, the color calibrated makes a big difference, but it, it all depends on how serious you want to get about your print. Now, with that all said, uh, this painting, I think, uh, again, I think I would go with this one right here myself. Uh, and then I would have to decide on whether I want the script work or not. Uh, but then I do like the, just the white cold press paper the best. And that is usually what I always use when I uh, do my paintings. Uh, but with that said, uh, I think this uh, demo is coming to a close and we'll consider this painting done. So again, until I see you out in the field or back at the studio, thanks for watching.